This is Will's Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. I'm being asked my opinion for the first time in about a year and a half from the mainstream media. Unbelievable. Did you have an answer to that question? What was your question? Sorry, it's been so long since I've been asked a question, I've forgotten how to answer. What's your reaction to what's happened today? I'm not surprised. I filmed uh, a brief video on my telegram before I went in suggesting that I was going to be found guilty uh, for two reasons. First of all, multiculturalism and diversity is our greatest strength. They're not just political slogans, they are the law. You can disagree with them. If you take steps to prevent multiculturalism or oppose it, you are breaking the law. Okay? That's the reality of our situation as Australian workers. Secondly, uh, it is technically illegal to criticise any ethnic or religi a a religious group in Australia. This is all... Uh, it all depends on how the state chooses to apply that law, meaning some groups will be defended with that law and others won't, obviously, such as my ethnic or religious group. But uh, yeah, if I knew this about the law from the beginning, I never would have appealed. There is no real defence against this. Uh, and that's the reality of our situation. So, yeah. And will you be taking any further action in regards to this? I'll consider it, but uh, the, my bank account's been closed down. My PayPal account's been closed down. Uh, the fact that I'm at court now wearing a suit is a miracle. So uh, the state's done everything it can to prevent me from raising any legal funds to defend myself or even to receive advice. advice. So anybody who says that everybody has the right to a, a fair trial in our glorious democracy doesn't know what they're talking about. A lot of people when they see you they just think you're a racist. What do you have to say to that? I don't think a lot of people think that. I think the media would suggest that a lot of people think that. But uh, yeah, I don't know what to say to that. What is a racist? Like, what does that mean? Are you still protesting or engaged in any activism? Yeah, definitely. I'll be getting back to it now that I don't have to go to court anymore, so yeah. How will you be protesting or what will you be protesting against? Well, the same thing I was essentially protesting in the beginning, which was never Muslim. Uh, that was one aspect of my activism that the state media, mainstream media, private state, doesn't matter, chose to focus on entirely in order to make me out to be some sort of anti-Muslim personality. But really, I was protesting against state policy and what I view as a, an extreme level of in institutional corruption, specifically government, media, education system, military, law enforcement. But how do you prove that by making a beheading video? How did you prove that? Well, yeah, I was pretty young and fresh at the time. Uh, we were just trying to do something absurd to just get attention and get more reach and you know just like a lot of political activists tried to push the boundaries just to get more attention at the time I suppose like uh, a lot's happened since then and I've, uh, I've evolved and my agenda's grown a lot so I can't imagine that we'll be engaging in any of that conduct again. This is Will's Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. So it's Thursday December 19th, 2019, uh, just past uh, 10 a.m. here in Melbourne outside the County Court of Victoria. Uh, Chief Judge of the P County Court, uh, Peter Kidd, has handed down his judgment in uh, Blair Cottrell's uh, appeal against his conviction under Section 25.2 of Victoria's Racial and Religious Tolerance Act uh, 2001. Uh, he was convicted at the Melbourne Magistrates Court in September 2017 along with Christopher Shortis and Neil Erickson uh, and fined $2,000. Uh, Blair was challenging the substantive charge and also the constitutionality of the law and the, the judges upheld both the constitutionality and the uh, guilty finding and conviction of fine of $2,000. So Blair it's basically the same judgment. Yeah, nothing changed, which means we essentially wasted our time and money. But uh, Well, you did. Yeah, but uh, I would think about appealing again to a higher court like I planned to do in the beginning. I wanted to get to high court or supreme court, but I was told go to county first. It's kind of hard to appeal though when I'm not permitted to have a bank account or to use PayPal to raise funds for legal defence or even advice. So, uh, you know, I think it's pretty amusing that uh, people say we have the right to a fair trial in this country, but uh, when you're on the wrong side of the law and politics is, invo is involved, uh, they close your bank account and, don't, and the bank tells you, oh sorry, we've got to do this, we can't explain why. It's over two years uh, since the uh, September 2017 Magistrates Court uh, trial and yeah, 
That's, uh, that's what I meant. It, it's cost you your bank account, your PayPal, and obviously uh, hard money. You've had to take constant time off work uh, to, to attend the, the various uh, mentions and of course the trial that happened uh, last month, uh, November 11 to uh, 14, which lasted for uh, four days. Uh, so that's also time, it's cost you time as well. Yeah, um, honestly, if I understood what this law meant, how it was worded and what it really what it really consisted of, I probably never would have appealed in the first place. Uh, because two things everybody should, under should understand about the Racial and Religious Tolerance Act. Uh, diversity and multiculturalism, they aren't just a political slogan, they are the law. You can disagree with that law, but if you take steps to prevent multiculturalism, openly and publicly, you could technically be breaking the law. And that's the reality of that act. Second thing, um, when you criticise a specific ethnic or religious group in this country, you're also technically breaking the law at the discretion of the state. So um, obviously that that law is not going to be brought into the into the defence of uh, white or Christian people, but other people, sure. But uh, yeah, if I understood this from the beginning, that I really didn't have much of a defence from the, in the first place, I wouldn't have wasted my time. But uh, a couple of years ago, there was there was various signs that it could turn out in my favour and I promised people that I would take it all the way, and so that's what I did. Uh, having sat in the, the trial for the full four days, I knew that it was going to be found to be both constitutionally valid, uh, both uh, at the, the federal Australian constitutional level, but also consistent with the Victorian Charter of Human Rights and uh, Responsibilities, uh, because we don't have a system of negative or personal rights in Australia, so it all came down to whether the judge would uh, uphold the conviction that you intended to incite severe ridicule, revulsion, contempt of Muslims with the mock beheading stunt? Yeah, well, um, I didn't expect it to be, especially after the four-day trial, it was very unlikely that it was going to be a finding in my favour, uh, especially because the amount of uh, resources that the state used against me. There was four prosecuting lawyers and a barrister and at least two, two lawyers or legal experts from the Attorney General's office. And on the other, other side of the bench was me and my sympathetic barrister, Mr. John Bolton. And the only reason I was able to take it this far is because my barrister was sympathetic to me in the first place. Otherwise, I wouldn't have even been able to afford it to go this far. So uh, I, I really don't see you know, the amount... Basically, I think 90% of the trial was the, uh, the state's legal experts speaking. And the other 10%, and that's being generous, was my barrister replying or giving his submissions. So almost three days of the original trial was just the prosecuting lawyers and the Attorney General's barrister just ranting on and referring the judge to dozens and dozens of precedents and things that other judges have said uh, to explain why I should be found guilty. So it was, it was really unlikely that the Chief Judge of the County Court had a choice but to find me guilty. Like, that much effort went into prosecuting me, there was really... There was really not much chance for me from the beginning. Well, it took him over a month to, to read all that case law and uh, make his judgment. He just gave a summary of his judgment uh, in the, the courtroom, which was a bit more packed than it was during the, the trial. Uh, there was a few more journalists and uh, I noticed a few other sort of uh, familiar faces there. And then when you came out of the, uh, the county court, uh, they're still here now, mainstream media, huge cameras, and you got asked questions by uh, Channel 9 and uh, ABC, which you were quite shocked by. I haven't been asked questions by any journalists for over a year since I was banned from ever appearing on Sky News for my horrible, atrocious, offensive views about about Australia having its own culture and how important it is to, uh, to preserve it. But uh, yeah, like, um, that's the first time a journalist has approached me for comment in a long time. I'd be surprised if it made it onto television at all. But because this is going to be a big LARP, a big LARP opportunity for the media to celebrate yet another careerist victory for uh, white corporate cocksuckers over the average working Australian, uh, I could imagine maybe I would get a snippet on TV just to further try to embarrass me. But uh, yeah, like the, the real problem in this country is not Muslims, and I was never really an anti-Muslim activist from the beginning. My agenda was quite extensive and broad. Mostly, my political activism was about highlighting institutional corruption in a government, at a government level, level of media, education, law enforcement, military. I viewed all these institutions as corrupt and being deliberately subverted to basically destabilise Australia and introduce a more authoritarian state regime similar to communism or an international communist uh, regime of some sort. 
uh, that was my the purpose of my activism but the state in this case has chosen to hone in on he said this about Muslim one uh, Muslims one time and have successfully duped the judge into believing that I was out just to insult Muslims you know but uh, what the funny the funny thing is that uh, my self-proclaimed political opponents, who I never considered opponents, they identified me as an opponent, the Marxists and the anarchist clubs, and uh, the, uh, the state prosecutor herself, they know I'm not guilty of setting out to offend Muslims, and not a single Muslim complained to, to have me sent to court on this particular occasion. This was all just a big witch hunt, an effort to try to intimidate me or maybe, uh, you know, shut me up, uh, waste my money, etc, etc. It's, it's done neither, really. I mean, like, I'm pretty resourceful, so I don't need a great deal of money to survive. And, uh, yeah, it, it hasn't really done anything to silence me. It's only further emboldened me and convinced me that there is an institutional corruption that's so extensive that when you when you try to highlight it, they'll take you to court and try to send you to jail. So, Well, Section 25 too, it is a criminal provision which has a maximum sentence of six months uh, imprisonment. So they, they might be celebrating your opponents uh, today, but uh, they would have liked you have the, the sentence to be increased and you be in jail right now. They would have liked that. I don't know why they didn't argue that. I think because I never actually appealed the uh, the sentence. I only appealed the conviction because a two thousand dollar fine to me is it's 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 easy to wear. Actually, I asked my barrister when that uh, sentence was uh, reimposed or upheld today. I asked my barrister, does that money go to the court or to the state? Because if it was going to go to the state, I'm not paying two thousand dollars. I'm not paying a single dollar to the state government. I would rather go to jail. And my barrister assured me that it's a court fine, so it goes to the courts. Are the courts corrupt? Probably, but not to the same level as the state. I, after, after having to answer to this, to this charge, been in court probably about 20 to 25 times over the past three years, I certainly wasn't going to leave court agreeing to pay any money to the state. So uh, it's a court fine. It's, I've got six months to pay it, I think, and uh, I've got no problem with that. But. Uh, like I said, whether or not I appeal again really depends on money and how sympathetic my barrister continues to be. But uh, like I said, it it's, it's, might not be worth appealing because there doesn't seem to be any serious or realistic defence against this charge except to say that it wasn't my intent to incite ridicule of Muslims. But then the judge will just say, well, I think it was, and then you're guilty. And really, you've just got to ask the judge to believe you. And then the prosecution asks the judge not to believe you. And the prosecution has a great deal of lawyers with them and the Attorney General. And they provide all these reasons why I shouldn't be believed. And that, that's really how it went down. It's, it's embarrassing, I think. It's an embarrassing charge. It's an embarrassing subsection of a law to use against a worker just for, just for criticising a, a specific act or group. I think it's interesting, though, that I was found guilty of, uh, of inciting ridicule or vilification, whatever. Uh, against the specific people on the grounds of a religious belief or activity because that suggests that beheading people is an aspect of religious belief or activity of Muslims and the judge has basically just affirmed that in his in his sentencing of me he's, he's finding me guilty so you know obviously in his ex explanation of why he sentenced me he might explain why that's not the case somehow but essentially it is the case uh, back in in 2015 when the the mock beheading stunt took place uh, that was your first year of activism uh, you're quite new uh, to the uh, to the scene you've you've now turned uh, 30 and you, you indicated to the mainstream media that you want to return to activism and commentary now also during this process you've been banned from Facebook and, and Twitter but you've started doing telegram videos which is an encrypted uh, messaging app uh, created by a pair of Russian dissident brothers so I don't think they're going to listen to the, the, the state to try and ban you and you're also on uh, have an account on gab.com and the, the CEO of Gab, uh, Andrew Torbo, reposted uh, this uh, judgment hearing today so I don't think he's going to kick you off as well. So you still do have a, a platform net, platforms now you can utilise. It's, yeah, I've got platforms but only a very small fraction of the people that once followed me are able to see me there. Uh, yeah, it's probably worth investing in to build up a, an audience once more. But uh, my political activism from the beginning, I was never really that passionate about it. I engaged in it because at the time it, it seemed to be a winning horse in terms of popularity. But I more enjoyed just uh, speaking to people about things that aren't really made clear to them, such as propaganda and the state's application of propaganda through entertainment and mainstream media. Uh, I, liked to, I liked to just talk about that kind of thing and 
help to educate people on that subject. Just help people understand what I've come to understand. And so I might get back into that first and see where that takes me. Uh, it's funny though that I never, who would have imagined that the only way to communicate freely with the public was to use, was to use uh, Russian hosted apps. You know, if somebody said that 20 years ago, they wouldn't believe it. But uh, yeah, now it's the West that's been, uh, that, that's, that seems to be uh, under the grip of speech control. And the Russians seem to have a lot more freedom now. So, you know, everything ebbs and flows. Well, you're not just disabled from Facebook and that you can't read it, but anyone who shares an image of you or mentions your name, including myself, unless they preface it with Blair Cottrell is a racist, fascist, Nazi, then they uh, get uh, cop a three or seven or 30 day ban uh, for violating the dangerous individuals policy. Yeah, I don't know who decided that I'm a dangerous individual. Uh, I don't, I have reason to believe based on a, a colleague I once was uh, friendly with in Victoria Police, that uh, my, my censorship from Facebook and my permanent banning uh, was the result of pressure from a number of intelligence agencies, state intelligence agencies, agencies such as the Australian Federal Police and the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, suggesting that I was a national security risk and that I shouldn't be allowed to use that, that application, that platform on Facebook. And of course, if you're Facebook staff, you're going to take something like that very seriously if it comes from a state government agency. So I think that's, that was the driving force behind my censorship. I can't prove that. Uh, maybe through some uh, campaign of freedom of information, I might be able to uncover that. But where I would even begin, I don't know. I'm not a learned academic, I'm just a carpenter. So somebody would need to help me with that to, to know, to, you know, to let me know where I would go to discover who is actually censoring me and why. Well, you, being well facebook has deemed you a dangerous individual yet you're still a a, a free uh, man and so obviously you're uh, going to take that forward into you mentioned on gab that you've entered your your 30s now and so uh you're planning a another decade of, of activism which i think will uh a lot of people will find very dangerous yeah free is an interesting way to describe any individual currently living in this state but i suppose you know we can walk down that street. Yeah, I can. Mm. I can also walk down the... Uh, I, I can walk through the main common area of a, of a prison unit as well, which almost is indistinguishable from this street. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, see what happens. Yeah. We're not, well, in my opinion, we're not uh, there yet. Uh, well, obviously, we'll hear more from you uh, in the coming weeks, months and years. Yeah, maybe. We'll see how we go. Thank you. This is Will's Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net.